Thank you. We've got a question from uh, Doyle McManus of the LA Times in the back. He's asking about direct bilateral talks between the US and Taliban. How important are they? How promising at this point? And how should they be structured? And where are you? He's in the uh, overflow room. Yeah, sorry, just to have a visual. Hi, thank you. Well, uh, I think that the speech by uh, the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was, uh, um, if you read it very carefully, at least the way I read it, was indicating that you, at a certain point, don't talk to friends and cousins, but you need, in order to produce peace, you need to talk to someone else as well. And therefore, one day, one day, it will be essential that a talk takes place, perhaps with the people who have given up at least the concept of wanting to end up with a scenario that is unacceptable, but perhaps not by putting that up front, but at the end of the discussion. Um, um, the first ones who need to talk to each other are the Afghans. And they should be in the lead. Also because if we don't allow them, they will do it anyway, and they should do it. But the American side, which has got so much stake, and thanks to America and due to America, everyone else is there, 46 countries, need to be involved. So they are important. And they are, uh, uh, the, um, I think, part of what should be one day, sooner the better, the beginning of the so-called political surge. Michael Lemon from the Near East South Asia Center. You uh, noted the key potential, the potential key role of the High Peace Council and President Rabani in moving along this transition strategy and the process of reintegration and reconciliation. Uh, it obviously has relatively limited capacity at the moment. And I was wondering about your thinking on what UNAMA, together with perhaps your Silk Road colleagues or others, uh, could do to support the work of the High Peace Council and what specific support you think they might need or might be interested from you and uh, perhaps an official group. Good. Let's start from uh, the assumption, and which needs to be serious and not, again, lip service. Uh, Afghan-led, uh, Afghan-owned, and so on, and then good luck we do it ourselves, because that won't work. I'm, I've been there 22 years ago in Afghanistan. If there is one thing which unifies all Afghans, and President Karzai, uh, sometimes quite emotionally, but uh, he sends the same message often. We are very proud people. Our future is ours, okay? So it needs to be Afghan-led, okay? That leads me to the fact, if you had to bet on internal, external uh, negotiators and so on, at the end of the day, it needs to be the Afghans, okay? Assisted and supported, certainly by main stakeholders like the US, otherwise that would not be sufficiently credible in the future, and then assisted by anyone who can do so. And UNAMA has established the SALAM support group, SALAM in terms of peace. We have established that uh, almost immediately upon the establishment of the High Level Peace Council, and it's got uh, three components. The first one is logistics. Logistics is 80% of negotiations, trust me, and I know many of you know it. You have to be able to be at the right place at the right time and be also in a way that you appear to be not contaminated. Flying, in other words, by a marine helicopter or flying by other ways may, in a way, give you a certain type of profile or identity. So we have been putting our own helicopters. We have eight of them in our three planes we have at the disposal of the Salam Support Group and therefore of the High Level Peace Council. They have used them, and they've used the logistical, which means facilitation approach, also very actively. Why? Because they needed to go all over the country to start talking to the ulemas, to the local community, and say, if we propose this, and they propose that, would you feel comfortable with that? What is your concern, is it, about that? And secondly, around the region. They've been to Turkey, they've been to Pakistan, and they've just announced, and with our support, to go to uh, the Iran. Second 
pillar of the Salam support group is substantive support. And a, a group of experts, about 18 of them, and very, very qualified, many very young people who have a remarkable capacity of having studied the Taliban's and the other side, and ready to work and prepare papers, position papers, options, analysis, all that which probably, according to the Afghan approach may require, especially if it's done in various languages, complicated. And have a roster of many other experts available for the actual substantive discussions. <coughs> Example, how do you fit, if you start discussing, the concept of maintaining a Islamic identity of the Afghanistan, which is a crucial thing, and at the same time maintaining, as we really want to maintain, all of us, and many, many Afghans, the, what has been acquired in terms of human rights and women's rights, for God's sake. We have now 69 women in the parliament, and by the way. So that is another area where we are involved. And three, in confidence building measures. You know, if one day there will be a need for a UN office in order to facilitate meeting between people who not, don't like to meet, that office can be easily opened by the UN without actually providing any type of excessive legitimacy to anyone. We are specialized in conferences and opening meeting offices anyway, the whole world, as you know. <laughs> so we are, we are pretty good at that. So we can also do a very useful office. And that would be another option that we are keeping in mind, in other words, how to support confidence building measures. Bottom line, we are equipped and uh, poised to support the formal and official negotiator team, which is the High Level Peace Council. Uh, just to, uh, these are two questions from NGOs uh, in the other room. They sort of follow up on what you've been talking about, both from uh, World Vision and uh, IRC. Uh, what should the political surge look like? Is there a case for coalition government personnel pulling back to enable non-state uh, slash NGO actors to operate more independently? And then a question about what happens to the rights of women and girls in a future Afghanistan. Um, is this a top priority for the future or too hard to preserve after 2014? Let's start with the last one, which is, uh, um, you probably know we, the UN had to be very firm on the issue about elections because in spite of the fact that elections were not perfect, but in a country like Afghanistan, in the middle of a war, and at, um, after uh, the other difficult elections, it would have been probably better not to have them. But once you have them, you at least uh, try to capitalize on the factor that you have institutions who start building up, such as the electoral commissions. They did their job. It was painful. They got 1.3 million votes out. They got 23 MPs excluded. And uh, it was a difficult process. But the move was, if there is an institution who works in Afghanistan, we need to help them. Because that's the beginning of fighting impunity. Now, on the same concept, we need to maintain, and we are, working on building up what has been achieved regarding women and human rights in particular. Um, I'm counting, of course, you could argue, and the colleague from World Vision is right in raising it, because it's a concern of many Afghan women is uh, if there is a discussion with the Taliban, does this mean that we are going to now pay the price, yielding, compromise, give up for the sake of making peace? Well, I hope and believe that would not be the case. 